Well, good morning to you. Thank you to those of you who are here and visiting with us. Thanks to those who are tuning in online. We're so glad that you're here this morning. And uh, as Barry mentioned and Wayne mentioned, it's 9-11. And it's crazy to think that those planes flew into the building, into the Twin Towers and into the Pentagon and into that field in Pennsylvania 21 years ago. Where were you 21 years ago? And I was talking to a mentor about 9-11 this week and he said something interesting. He said, you know, in that brief moment, all pettiness went away. And we as a country focused on what really matters. I thought, wow, that is true. Heroes were raised up that day. And in the midst of chaos and terror, we saw kind of a heartbeat of our nation and just began to pray, oh God, would it not take a terrorist attack like that to unite us again? Would you bring us together as a country somehow through revival, through prayer, through spiritual awakening? Oh God, do that. And I just was grateful for our country and the fact that in 21 years, something like that has not happened again. Well, we're uh, in a series right now walking through the book of Numbers together, which if you've been with us, uh, you've seen that these stories in the book of Numbers are a lot more exciting than the title of the book. Uh, it's, it's filled with uh, stories of God's faithfulness, but rebellion from God's people and restoration happening. And, and there's all of that happening this morning. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to turn in your Bible to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible. And we're going to hang out the majority of our time in Numbers chapter 14. And then if you grabbed a bulletin on the way in, the third page of that bulletin is a sermon notes page. You can grab a pen and follow along with us because uh, we're diving into some deep stuff this morning. Well, I grew up in a family with identical twin sisters. And, uh, and it was really fun. It, it was always made our family kind of unique to have identical twin sisters. But there's one golden rule with twin sisters. You don't mix up their name, okay? It happens a lot in their life and they're gracious, but not with the family. It's not cool if your brother calls you the wrong name. So I got pretty good at even the back of their head. I'm like, yeah, that's Shannon. I know it, you know? And then I ended up marrying a twin and that upped the ante quite a bit. And uh, my wife's name is Jen and her Twins name is Jess and they're also identical twins. I think we have a picture. And so I knew right at the get go, oh man, I better not mess this one up. And I'm happy to report to you that my track record of calling them the right name is pretty good, but it's not perfect. <laughs> uh, I have failed at least two times and they have been painful. The first time was right after we started dating and I'm like, I like this girl a lot. So I took her out to coffee and I decided to have that define the relationship conversation. You know, like I really want to pursue you. I want to be boyfriend, girlfriend. Let's, let's do this thing. And uh, so I'm going through my spiel that I was all nervous about. And I finally get to the end and I so eloquently say, I have so enjoyed getting to know you, Jess. And she goes, what did you call me? And my eyes get big and I said, what did I call you? Oh no. And I bumbled through the rest of the spiel and somehow she decided to stay, you know, with me. And, and we were dating and things were going well. And then a few months later, I get a text from Jen and I look at it and it's a picture of her, kind of a, kind of a funny picture that she had sent or so I thought it was her. And so I send back the little heart eye emojis and I say, oh wow, you look so good, you're cute, you know? And she replies, that's not me. I think we have a, and I went, yikes, how do you recover, you know, from that moment? And uh, I'm happy to say, eventually we worked through it and I got married and I can tell you that I love Jess with all my heart. Uh, <laughs> kidding, kidding, it's in my notes, okay. Well, the story that we're studying today, we're kind of picking up right in the middle of the Israelites' beautifully flawed journey, okay? And, and we laugh at, at some of my failures and maybe some of you cringe, but as we look at the Israelites, it's far more sobering and even frustrating the failures that they've had. They're like a Texas A&M football team, okay? <laughs> it's rough. And so that's what we're picking up today. Let's pray and then we'll dive into this together. Father, we thank you so much for the time uh, to worship and to sing about your goodness. 
And God, even singing that here on the front row here, just with tears in my eyes as, as the realization that life is not easy. We don't sing that because, oh, it's just so fun to say that you're good. It's because it's true. And God, wherever we are today, Lord, I pray that you would impress on our hearts, despite whatever pain or sickness or struggle or strife or conflict, God, you are good. And we can sing that with confidence. Oh God, we wanna have an encounter with you this morning. We wanna hear from you through your word. So God, would the distractions go away? And God, would you speak to us? Your servants are listening. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I wanna do a quick flyover of where we are contextually in the book of Numbers, and then we'll dig in. So if you look at your notes, there's just a a few uh, contextual points that we're gonna hit before we dive in. The first is, as you look at the whole book of Numbers, it can be separated into three different wildernesses with two road trips in between. So where we've been up to this point is in the wilderness of Sinai. And then last week, there was a little road trip that that we were on, which gets us to the second wilderness and the first fill in the blank in your notes, which is the wilderness of Paran, P-A-R-A-N. And that's where the middle part of, of Numbers is. Then there's gonna be another road trip and the book is gonna end in the wilderness of Moab. And so if you look in your notes, there's a thematic timeline, a chapter breakdown of everything that's happened up to this point. But the big idea and the big thing we we need to know going into today's text is they're in the wilderness of Paran, which is about halfway to the promised land. This is a journey that's supposed to take two weeks that we're gonna find out it's gonna take the Israelites 40 years. And we're gonna find out why that's the case today. Chapter 13 is the backdrop to where we're really gonna spend most of our time today, but I wanna summarize it for us. If you have your Bible, flip over maybe one page to Numbers chapter 13. We're just gonna read a few verses, starting in verse one. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the people of Israel. And these were their names. And then it goes down and it lists out each of the tribes of Israel and each of the chiefs that went as the spy uh, into the promised land. But there are two names that we wanna make sure to highlight. The first is a guy named Caleb from the tribe of Judah. And he's gonna show up again in a little bit. And the other spy, the other chief is the name Hosea, which means he saves. And Moses is gonna change Hosea's name to Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. And so he changes Joshua's name, he gathers up the spies and he says, you guys, there's two commands. You need to evaluate the land and you need to be of good courage. And then he sends the spies into the land and they're there for 40 days. uh, They cover 220 miles worth of the promised land area. They gather up some fruit and they come back. And in verse 25, they give their report. And rather than just reporting what they've seen, they actually exaggerate the things that they've seen and invoke fear into the people. But it's not all of the spies. One of the spies named Caleb, he steps up and in verse 30, he says, no, no, this is a good land. God is going to give it to us. We are able to go in. But the 10 other spies other than Joshua, they rise up and they say, no, we are not able to go in. And the backdrop of Numbers chapter 14 are these two conflicting reports that the people have before them and it's their decision, what are they gonna do? Which one are they gonna obey? And as we go through this story together, we're gonna see that the story will prove that it was actually much easier to get the Israelites out of Egypt than to get Egypt out of the uh, Israelites. And that sets us up to chapter 14. In chapter 14, we're gonna read it together and we're gonna focus on two takeaways specifically related to failure. If you've been with us for the past month and a half or so, you heard Pastor Jim at the beginning of August give a message on failure, which was fantastic. And I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. And his message kind of covered overarching failure, like you tried something and you failed at it. This message is gonna be related specifically to failure dealing with sin. So the first takeaway that we're gonna get from Numbers chapter 14 is this. 
It's that failure begins with believing a lie. Failure begins with believing a lie. Let's pick up in Numbers chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 1. So how did the people respond to these two reports? Verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those and had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they said to all the congregation of the people, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. How did the people respond? Verse 10, then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. We'll stop there. So the people had a great test before them. Which uh, report were they gonna obey? And we see that they failed the test. They bought into the fear that the 10 spies had invoked in them and, they, and it led them to confusion and to feeling overwhelmed and hopeless. So much so that they would rather die in the wilderness or go back to Egypt. And you go, how in the world could they have fallen into this? This isn't even the first time that they've wanted to go back to Egypt. It's happened twice before this. How could it happen? And I believe it's this. It's because they fell for the lie. Well, what was the lie? What was it deep down that they actually fell for? And it's this. The lie was that God was not for them that God was not good, that God was trying to deprive them of something, that God was using this to, to, to get them all killed in this promised land and they fell for it. And as you think about it, this is the same lie that shows up at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter three. I've got a little chart in your notes of the parallels, but if you were a Hebrew reader who was reading this story for the first time, it would have clicked for you instantly. Wow, it's the Garden of Eden happening all over again. It's Adam and Eve happening all over again. How could they have fallen for the lie? And as you look in your notes, you see that fruit shows up in the Garden of Eden and in Numbers 13 and 14. Fig leaves show up. There's an exaggeration in both stories, but the main takeaway would be that in both stories, there was deception. In Genesis chapter three, the snake comes up to Adam and Eve and he says, you will not surely die. The command that God gave you to not eat that fruit, he gave to you because he's trying to deprive you of something. He doesn't actually want what's best for you. He's trying to hold power close to his chest and he doesn't want what's best for you. You're not gonna die, just eat it. And that's the same lie that the people believe from in Numbers 13 and 14 that came from the spies when they said, we will not be able to go up. God gave a clear command and he said, I want you to go into that land. I'm giving it to you. And the spies say, no way. There's no way God can give it, this to us. It's a trap. We're all going to die. God is not for us. He's against us. And we see in both stories, the punishment is the same. In Genesis 3, they're banished from the garden. And in Numbers 13 and 14, none of them are going to be able to go into the promised land. But the promise is similar as well. In Genesis 3, God speaks to the serpent and he says the offspring, her offspring is going to end up crushing your head. There's a typo in your notes uh, and he's going to crush your heel. And then in Numbers 13 and 14, he says, uh, your little ones, the same ones you thought were going to die in the land, they're going to be the ones who actually go in it. But we see that in both stories, there's a theme that's the same and that's that both Adam and Eve and the people of Israel fell prey to the lie that God was not really good and God was not really for them. It's interesting that when Joshua and 
Caleb starts speaking, they don't refute what the 10 spies are saying about the land. They don't say, ah, yeah, they're big, but they're not that big. Ah, you know, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be that hard. They don't say that. They, in, in many ways, what they were saying was true. But what they said was, do you understand who our God is and the promise that we have from him? It's not about downplaying our adversary. It's about understanding our advocate. The one who's on our side is better. And that's exactly what they say in verses eight and nine. Our God can defeat them. He's on our side. This is what the apostle Paul will say in Romans chapter eight. If you've read Romans chapter eight, you you know at the end, he says that, man, we're all being killed. We're all being led to the slaughter. This life is hard. But then he says in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Do you understand who God is? If he's promised it, it will happen. You gotta grab hold of that for the people of Israel and for us here in the New Testament. Look at uh, what Rick Warren says about what we believe. See, what it came down to for, these, for the people of Israel is their belief was off. They weren't believing that God was gonna be true to his word. Rick Warren says, all behavior is based on a belief. And behind every sin is a lie that I'm believing. Ben Stewart says it this way. He says, what you think about is what you care about and what you care about is what you chase. How did they fall prey to such a destructive uh, uh, failure? It's because they believed a lie that God was not really for me, he's against me and it led to destruction in their life. That's why the Apostle Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 10, verse five, we need to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Why? Because failure begins in our head, then it trickles down to our heart, and then it permeates out to our hands and to our feet. It's always how it goes. It starts in our heads. Ben Stewart, who I quoted just a second ago, had a profound impact on my life when I went to school up at A&M. And when I was there, he, he was leading a, um, a ministry, a Bible study on campus called Breakaway. And Ben talked about how his dog, it was named Tiger, he talked about this exact concept in the story of his dog, and I just wanna share it with you. He said, when Donna and I, his wife, were newlyweds, we were given a dog a beautiful bridal coat, black mouth cur named Tiger. She was a total head case. She would run away from squirrels and hide from cats. If you reached out your hand to pet her, she would wince and pee on the floor. Awesome. (laughs) When we'd been told uh, later that she'd been discarded in the woods by her previous owner, and over time we discovered that her master had been cruel. We did not hit her. We spoke kindly to her and took good care of her but she was constantly reacting to her current safe environment, including her new owners, with fear. She lived in a new reality, but with an old mentality. Her identity changed from abused to loved, from discarded to adopted. Her position in life had shifted, and now she needed to shift her perspective. Beliefs inform behaviors, and she had to decide to believe what was now true. He said, well, over the course of a few months, we watched the implications of her new identity begin to impact her beliefs and activity. She quit wincing from our hands. She stopped fleeing from us. She actually began to rest. Then she began to do something interesting. She began to follow me around everywhere. She wanted to be near me. She would guard me like a sentry when I studied. She would sweep the perimeter of our house in signs for danger when we were hanging out in the backyard. She became the protector of our children and would leap in front of any snake or squirrel or bird that appeared to be a threat. She owned her new identity and it began over time to shape her activity. Her position changed in a moment. Her perspective and behavior changed through a process. He says, we have been given a new identity And we now take up the process of working out the implications of this change in our lives. This is where the fight begins. Our battle begins with belief. So the question for us is like the Israelites and like Tiger, the dog, what lies are you potentially believing about yourself or about your situation or about God right now? And just as I began to think of lies that I've believed in my own life, I wrote them down and they're in your notes of certain things that we're just so prone as humans to grab onto and believe. 
The first one I thought of is the lie that if God was good, he wouldn't let me go through this pain. I have uttered those exact words to God in a trial many times. God, if you're really good, and if you're really in control, like we say and we sing about, then why in the world would you let this happen? Are you in control or not? And yet what I didn't realize at that moment was I was buying into the same lie that Adam and Eve believed in the garden and that the people of Israel believed in, in Paran and that I was believing in my situation. God, you must not be good for me to endure this kind of pain. Maybe it's the lie that, hey, everybody's doing this certain thing, so it's not gonna hurt anybody if I jump in and do it too. And think about how tame that seems, but then when you talk to anybody who's been addicted to something that they are trying to fight, that they are making war against, how did it always start? Man, everybody was doing it. And I just wanted to jump in. It felt harmless at the time. It was just something that, you know, it was just little. And I didn't see the trajectory of where this lie would lead in my life. If I could go back, I'd change that in a heartbeat. That's a lie that we believe. I think the greatest lie that we tend to fall into is the lie of this is the last time. I'm just going to call him one last time. I'm just going to drink this one, one last time. I'm just going to watch this w- one last time. I'm just going to say this one last time. I'm just going to do this one last time. But it's a lie. We don't need closure with sin. Instead, we say, by the power of God's spirit, that was the last time behind me. I don't need to do that again. Oh God, help me never do it again by the power of your spirit in me. No more times. Maybe it's the lie of, I could never believe in a God who would, where we allow the culture around us to say, okay, this is what the culture's saying, so God, you need to fit inside of what's culturally allowed rather than going, God, who are you? And whoever you are is who I'm gonna believe in regardless of what it costs me on this life. Some of you, the lie that you believed is words that were spoken over you when you were a kid or, or years ago that were said in, in jest or, or, or flippantly or said over you and you've continued to hold on those words of, I'm not smart, I'm not intelligent, I'm not worth anything, I'm not skinny, I'm not funny, I'm not whatever, and you continue to hold on to those words and maybe God has you here today to deal with that, to hear these words and, and to hear God say, I didn't speak that over you, Do you believe my words or do you believe those lies that were said over you? I'm reading a book right now called Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. And I'm early on in the book, but the first couple chapters is this this counselor, this doctor saying, fathers, do you realize the kind of weight you have in your daughter's lives? The words that you say are so powerful, they can combat the lies that the culture and your daughter's friends and her, you know, and the media is telling her, do you realize the power in your words? And then she also said, do you know the power you have to breathe those same lies into her identity, into her body, into her worth, into her intelligence, into her mentality? Do you realize that your flippant comment about, ah, have you realized how much you're eating can set a trajectory for her life to where years later, she's still holding on to that lie. And some of you have been living in that. And the person who spoke the lie doesn't even know it, but that's what the world that you've been living in. And maybe God has this morning, you deal with that lie. Why? Because what you think about is what you care about. And what you care about is what you chase. The failure that the Israelites fell into started with believing a lie. That's the first takeaway that we see in this text. The second failure, the second takeaway is that we see that failures have consequences, but failure is not final. We see that failures have consequences, but failure is not final. And we're going to read a large chunk of the the rest of this passage. And I'm going to warn you, it's long. So we're going to get into story time a little bit. But even as I was praying about, oh, God, should I just summarize it and kind of give my commentary? It's like, God said, no, Tyler trust my words. I want to speak through my inerrant written word this morning. I said, okay. And so we're going to read this together. Would you follow along? And then we'll have some thoughts. Look at verse 
Numbers chapter 14 uh, in verse 10. It says, then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but then God shows up. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? That's it. I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make you, Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. But Moses said back to the Lord, God, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up this people in your might and from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face. And your cloud stands over them and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give them, that he has killed them in this wilderness. And now, please, let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, and he quotes Exodus 34, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live and as all the earth be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of them, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, has followed me fully. I will bring into the land, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked generation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into this land where I swore that I sh should make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken Surely this I will do to all this wicked generation who are gathered together against me. In the wilderness, they shall come to a full end and there they shall die. And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land returned and made the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report against the land. The men who brought up a bad report of the land died by plague before the Lord. And of those who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive. Wow. This section proves that our failures have consequences. The ESV study notes say this. They say, the story of the spies illustrates an important principle. When God forgives sin, he does not always eliminate the consequences of sin. In the case of Israel, God's forgiveness meant that they remained the people of God in a corporate sense. The covenant made at Sinai that the Lord would be their God and that Israel would be his people was maintained. Yet, the people still suffered for their sin. They did not enter Canaan, but they died in the wilderness. And you read this and you hear about all the things that God is gonna do to the people of Israel. And, and if you're anything like me, you go, wow, God, that's a lot. You're gonna do all that to your people, the one that you had covenanted with. And yet, when you really think about it, God was only giving them exactly what they wanted. That's the next fill in the blank there. God was actually giving them what they wanted. 
uh, in verse 28, he says that exact thing. He says, what you have said, that is what I will do to you. And if you go back to verses two through four, the people, when they first hear the report, they tell God what they want. They say three things. They say, one, we don't wanna go into that land. And two, we wanna go back to Egypt. And three, we'd rather just die in this wilderness. So what does God do? Verse 23 through 24, he says, all right, that's what you want. Then none of you will see the land. Verse 25, you wanna go back to Egypt? Well then turn and go by the way of the Red Sea. Head on back to Egypt. And verses 29 and 32, he says, your bodies shall fall in this wilderness. They complained and God gave them exactly what they wanted. This is what's called, called God's passive wrath. Some of you as parents have said this statement before. Your kids are begging or begging or begging. You know it's not what's best for them. And finally you go, fine. You want to face the consequences of your actions? Fine. I'm stepping out. And you know as a parent, it hurts you to say that because they're going to feel pain. But it's, it's passive discipline. It's passive wrath. And you go, okay, I'm letting you feel the pain of your own consequences. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 1, 28, when he says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. The punishment that we see is God saying, fine, if that's what you want, I'm going to let you have it. And yet in the midst of this failure and in the midst of these consequences, we do see a glimmer of hope. We see this moment, and we're going to come back to it later. If you have questions about it, I did too. But a moment where God says, you know what? I'm wiping them all out. I'm done. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. And Moses gets before God, and he pleads on behalf of the people before God for God to relent of his judgment to the people so that the nations would not see God wipe out his people, but instead would watch God deliver them into the promised land. And God says, okay, I'm going to do it. And we'll come back to that. But the other thing is God says, my plan will not be thwarted. Whereas these people are gonna face the consequence of their sin, their kids are gonna be the one to take that land eventually. And my plan will continue into the, into the promised land. And so we see a glimmer of hope in the midst of the consequence of failure. And as you think about the Bible of the, some of the characters that we've looked up to for so long, it is amazing to me how many of these characters failed big time? Not a little mess up, like big time, big time sin. Think about it. Abraham, two times he lied about his wife to Pharaoh, and then he slept with another woman who is not his wife. Moses, Moses murdered a guy, and then he fled for his life, and God called him back to Egypt, and he said, no, I don't want to go back to God. And then what we'll read about in a little bit is God gives Moses a clear command. Hey, I want you to speak to this rock. And out of anger, Moses is going to hit it. And he himself is going to forfeit his ability to go into the promised land. Think about David, the man after God's own heart, King David, who slept with another man's wife and then had that man killed. And yet was the king after God's own heart. Think about Peter who denied Jesus three times, invoking a curse on himself, saying, I don't know that man, and cursed am I if I do, in front of Jesus in his moment of suffering. And yet Peter would go on to lead the church. There is no failure that is too far for God. Some of us need to hear that today. We feel the consequences. We felt the wrath. We, we realized the punishment, and yet God says, I can still use you in the midst of failure. Just like Abraham and Moses and David and Peter, I continue to use them. But each of these people, each of these characters had to face the consequence of their failure and they had to own it. So where do you need to take ownership of failure in your own life? Very often when we fail, it's easy to... Uh, pass the blame to someone else and go, well, you don't really understand the family that I grew up in or you, if you knew the wife I was married to or if you knew what was going on in my world or what my boss was telling me to do and we, we put it on everybody else rather than going, what David said in Psalm 51, against you, O oh Lord, have I sinned. It's my fault. I did it. And you own the failure. 
but you don't go to the extreme to heap judgment and condemnation and guilt on yourself and to say, see, I'm just such a failure. There's no hope for me. I knew it. Stepping back into church, it's just another reminder of how terrible I am because remember David and Abraham and Moses, you are not too far, but we need to take ownership of where we have failed. Look at application number two. Where have you seen the consequences of failure in your own life? Maybe there were words that we talked about earlier. You're the father who spoke words over your daughter that has haunted her for years and you've never owned it. Well, maybe God's calling you to own that today. Maybe it's your marriage. There's something that you did in your marriage, something that you hid in your marriage, something that you said to your wife or to your husband that's caused immense pain. And you've pushed it on everybody else and you've given a million reasons and maybe God's calling you to own it. Say, against you, oh God, I sinned, I messed up. I alone am to blame. Maybe it's in your parenting or your friendships. You watch the friendship explode and God's calling you to make that right. Maybe it's in work or in school or hidden sin. Or maybe you are Caleb and Joshua and you're around somebody and you're watching them, their life implode and they're blaming everybody else and they're, they're, they're not facing the consequence of their sin. And, and in fact, you're wanting to come in and rescue them and, and maybe God's just calling you to continue to faithfully pray for them and continue to love them, but to not allow them to, to heap on continual blaming of other people and instead to that passive wrath to go, okay, God, oh Lord, would you help them deal with this moment in their lives? What is it for you? Where have you seen the consequences of failure in your life? It's when we humbly deal with failure that God is ready to deal with us. And that's what I wanna spend the end of our time dealing with. I, I wanna address the elephant in the room when it comes to this text. And it's what I've been wrestling with all week. And it's, God, did you change your mind when you were gonna wipe out the people and Moses a man said, no, 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 God, you don't want to do that. And you said, oh, okay, yeah, 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 you're, you're right. Is that what happened? Is that right? And I want to deal with that with the rest of our time. As you look at the last page of your notes, there's a conclusion, and I believe it comes down to this. And it's God's heart for repentance. God's heart for repentance. As we look at a difficult question like this, or as you're reading and you see something that sounds contradictory, you wanna interpret scripture with scripture and look at what is the grand narrative of what God's word is saying. And so we look, I have some scriptures there in your notes. Malachi 3, verse six, God says this of himself. He says, for I, the Lord, do not change. So God is saying of my character, I don't change. In Numbers 23, 19, that we're gonna... Uh, read here in a few weeks. It is said, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man, here it is, that he should change his mind. God is not like ma a man in that he does not change his mind. But there are passages like this in scripture that sure make it seem like God changes his mind. Exodus 32, 14, it says, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And then Numbers 14, verse 20, what we just read, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So what do we do with this? I spent all week wrestling with it and going to different sources and talking to different people, but there was a short conversation I had with Pastor Jim that crystallized it for me. And he said this statement, and I have it there in your notes. Jim said, where I've landed is that God has unchangingly decided to relent of judgment when people repent. I'm gonna read that again. He said, where I've landed is that God has unchangingly decided to relent of judgment when people repent. So God in his character does not change. Those scriptures that we read are true. But in God's sovereign, unchanging character, he has decided that when my people uh, understand what they've done and they repent of their sin, I will always relent of the judgment that is due them always. And I'm unchanging in that fact. That is just a beautiful truth for us to hold on to today. God is unchanging in that he will relent of judgment when we repent. Look at Psalm 51. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. What does God want? A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you do not despise. 
And then Jesus in Luke chapter 18, he's telling a story of a Pharisee's prayer life versus a tax collector's prayer life. And the Pharisee stands up in front of everyone and he goes, man, I'm awesome. I've got everything figured out. I tithe all my money. I I pray all the time. Man, uh, I wear the right clothes. I'm not like that tax collector over there. I am killing it. And then we get into the prayer life of the tax collector. And it says in verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What is Jesus saying? What is David saying in Psalm 51, what does God delight in most? It's not the, per- the person who's perfect in their own eyes thinking, man, I am killing it in every way. God doesn't look in that and go, yeah, that's what I'm after. It's not. What God delights in most is the humble person who realizes where they failed and they repent before God and they confess that before him and say, I have messed up, I have sinned. Oh God, beating their breasts, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. And God is unchanging in the fact that he looks at that person and says, I love to grant, to grant my favor, to relent of my judgment on that person. That's who I delight to, to look at. And that's just an amazing truth for us to think about in light of the failures that we have in our life. And yet in the story that we read, the people didn't do that. Moses did. Moses mediated on behalf of the people and said, oh God, they messed up. And so I repent on their behalf. And we praise God for what Moses did. And God did relent of judgment because of Moses, but Moses was not a perfect mediator. Moses ended up in a few chapters uh, later, he'll need mediation before God as he will sin and, and face the consequences of that. And as we look through each of the biblical characters, none of them measure up until we meet this man in Nazareth named Jesus. And when Jesus steps on the scene, he says of himself, I'm better than Moses. I'm better than Abraham. I'm better than David. And the Pharisees are going, what? You can't say that about yourself. No one's better than these guys. And he says, yes, I am better. You know why? Because all those guys continued to sin. All of them, they, they, they tried to mediate and they did for a little bit, but then they failed. I will be the mediation for the world. And at the cross, think about it. At the cross, the punishment of God and the pardoning of our sin meet. And it's at the cross. That's why we're obsessed with it. And we put it on the, in our churches where we go, wow, at that moment, a perfect mediator was, was murdered on my behalf so that for my failures and so that for my, the, the times where I have spit on the face of a holy God, that cross stands a rem, as a reminder of God's grace towards me. I cannot outfail his grace. And when we look at the cross, we have verses like 2 Corinthians 5, 21 in our minds that say, for our sake, he, God made him, Jesus, to be sin so that uh, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. It's John 3, 16 that we sang at the beginning that for God so loved the world, us broken, fallen uh, failures. He loved us so much that he sent his own perfect son, to, to pay our, to, to replace us, to pay our debt so that we could have eternal life. You think about the beauty of what that means. And, and I wanna end just thinking about the person even right now. Because I've, I've had this conversation in my mind after sinning. Have you had that before where you know you just blew it and you go, well, God's grace is sufficient, but man, I just did something. You don't even know what I did. is so spit on the face of God. There is no way. Like if I just assume his grace now, there's no way. And I think some of us even in this room would go, I believe that, I know that that's true, but Tyler, you don't get it. I have gone too far. What I've said and done to my family, the things I've looked at, the actions I've participated in are too far, man. I'm just trying to be good enough. I just wanna come to church and just have a couple righteousness so that God might look at me and go, all right, fine, I guess I'll let you in. And some of us are there and I, I get it. God's grace is not something to just be assumed, something to wrestle with, to go, is that really true of me? 
And it gets to a passage in Revelation chapter three that's incredibly convicting to me, but it's incredibly comforting. Jesus is speaking to a wicked church in the city of Laodicea. And he says to this church, he says, I know your deeds and you guys are wicked. You are evil. You're so disgusting to me that I wanna spit you out of my mouth. You are that gross. He says, you are wicked and you're blind and you're pitiful and you're disgusting to me. And it's to that church that he says in Revelation 3, 19 and 20, he says, but to those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So I'm reaching out, be zealous and repent. Behold, church in Laodicea, church in America, Grace Fellowship, I stand at the door and I am knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone, the person who thinks he's failed too much, I will come into him and he with me. But in order for that to be the case, you gotta actually let me in and you gotta put your agenda to the side and I need to be enough for you. The Israelites are eventually gonna come to their senses and they're gonna realize they've sinned and they're gonna go, oh, okay, so we can't get the promised land. All right, we're gonna go. And they start making their way and Moses goes, no, no, if you go now, God's presence isn't gonna be with you. And they're like, well, we're never really interested in God's presence. We wanted the promised land. That's what we were after. And he goes, all right, fine. And they go and they're defeated. And it proves that what they were after was the land, not their Lord, not God. So what does it mean to be a Christian? It's coming to God with open hands and saying, God, I have failed. There's nothing I can do to earn your grace. I put my agenda to the side. I surrender to you. And I just say, you say you're knocking on the door despite what I've done. So I'm just opening it up. And I'm saying, okay, God, I'm listening to you. And I want you. Would you save me? Have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says to that person, come home. You're here, you're mine, I want you. And the rest of your life, there's an exchange that's gone, gone on. Failure for favored one. You're my son, you're my daughter, you're mine. You're no longer a failure, you're my son, you're my daughter. So for you, what is the, the application? What's the takeaway coming out of today? Maybe it's that as you hear this truth, you need to actually open the door Stop playing the am I good enough game and go, I'm not good enough. I'm not. So God, I open the door fully to you. My agenda goes away. I want Jesus. I want to take on your righteousness on my own. Maybe you're already a Christian, but you need to confess sins and ways that you've continued to fail in your life. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all unrighteousness. Maybe it's coming back at 6 p.m. tonight to this worship center and worshiping God with no agenda, no message, no agenda. We're just coming to be in the presence of God and say, I just love you. I just want to be with you. Maybe it's combating the lies that you have a tendency to believe by soaking your mind in what is true. So it's signing up for a small group or it's getting involved in the men's and women's Bible study that kicks off, each of them kick off this Tuesday. And you can find that information online or in the kiosk back there. But it's signing up and going, I'm in. I, I wanna soak my mind in what's true. Or maybe it's even just as we sing this last song, rather than running home and going, oh, the Texans, have they scored? You know, you sit and go, I'm just gonna sit in God's presence five minutes and I'm just gonna give this to him and listen and, and connect with you. What is it? for you. We're going to end our services appropriately today by taking of the Lord's Supper of communion. Think about what Jesus did the night before he died. He gathered up his disciples and he said, hey, see this bread? This is my body and it's about to be broken for you. And I want you to eat this. I want my body inside of you so that every time that you take it, you remember what I've done. He said, this is the, he took a cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this, have me inside of you such that when you're prone to think I've gone too far, he, he can't love me, that man, my body and my blood are inside of you to remind you of God is now, God's righteousness, Christ himself is inside of me. He says, take this and remember me. If you're a Christian, that's what we're doing today. We're participating in the body and the blood, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. And if you're not a Christian, then let today be the day. 
come before God, no agenda, and say, God, I'm I'm all yours. I love you. And and then take of communion as a son, as as a daughter of Jesus. Uh, Let's pray and then take communion. Father, thank you that you take failures and you make them favored ones. Oh God, solidify that truth into our heart. Help us think about it so that we care about it, so that we chase after you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. This prayer altar is open. Come and pray. If you cup your hands like this, uh, we'll pray with you. If not, we'll leave you alone. Take communion when you're ready.